I want to invite you to meet me in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. Captain Charlie Plum was a naval aviator during the Vietnam War. He was stationed on the USS Kitty Hawk. He had flown 74 successful missions, and his 75th was to be his last before he had the opportunity to go home. And on a day that went from celebration of the potential of seeing his family during his 75th mission, he was blown out of the sky over a battlefield in Vietnam. And the day that went from the prospect of going home ended up being the reality of spending the next six to seven years in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam. Fast forward a number of years, and uh, the war had concluded. Captain Plum was home, and he began talking about his experience there in the prison of war camp. And he became a bit of a public speaker. He was doing the speaking circuit, and he said one night in a restaurant in Kansas, he was sitting there eating dinner. And this guy locked eyes with him from across the restaurant. And it was one of those situations where he didn't know if he owed the guy money and that something was about about to happen. He wasn't sure if he was about to need to throw fists or if he was supposed to know the guy. But the guy gets up from his table, walks over to Captain Plum's table, and he says, you're Captain Charlie Plum, right? Stationed on the USS Kitty Hawk, you flew... A ton of successful missions, but you got shot down, spent six or seven years in a, in a prisoner of war camp. Are, are you, you're that Char, Charlie Plum, right? Captain Plum said, uh, I am. H- how do you know me? The guy grinned. He said, man, I packed your parachute. I'm glad to know that it worked. Shook his hand and left. And Captain Plum <laughs> obviously was a bit taken back from that experience. And that night he was thinking about how many times that he as a pilot walked by, walked past the room on the USS Kitty Hawk where those guys faithfully packed those parachutes, not thinking about what they were doing, not thinking about how what they were doing was vital to their survival. That if, if things are going well, if the, the mission goes as it's supposed to go, that, that they don't even need the work of those guys. But the days where you get blown out of the sky, you better have a good parachute. And he got to thinking about just in life, how many people have proverbially packed his parachute and how many people's parachute he is indeed packing. And and ultimately, that's, that's what we're doing here today. We, we hope that you don't experience the, the days of life like Captain Plum, where you figuratively get blown out of the sky, but we've all experienced that. We've all experienced days where we expect things to go well, we expect things to be fine, and we wake up, and in 30 minutes into the day, we realize this day is going to be heavy. And so it's those days that we need these parachutes, these, those days that we need something to root our, and anchor our life to. And that's what we do here. That's what we hope to do here every Sunday that we are able to get together and open God's Word. And I want to remind you that many, many countries in the world, what we're doing now would get us arrested and in some cases killed. So we get to open God's Word. We get to read from Him. We get to worship Him. And sing about his name, that's a privilege to do that. But in doing that, what we hope that we're doing is we're packing your parachute with the things that you need, with the truth that you need, so that whenever things go sideways, you can survive the day. And so the question then is, what is our trust in? We, we just got finished uh, walking through the Lord's Prayer and, and how um, that because God's name is holy and set apart, that, that that motivates everything else that we do. The bread that we pray for every day, we pray for the bread to sustain us so that we can glorify his name. 
But the, uh, there's a baseline in prayer that we must contend with, and that baseline is trust, right? You know, it's, it's, it's easy to trust somebody whenever they give you everything that you could possibly want. You think that that's a good thing. As a parent, I'm finding out that's not necessarily a good thing. You don't give your kids everything that they want. Sometimes you have to say no. There's a famous song by somebody who's not a theologian, but it's fairly accurate theology. He says, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. And I wish that you knew how hard it is for me not to break out into a song here in this moment. <laughs> but this is not karaoke. This is preaching. <laughs> but it's difficult whenever we pray a prayer and God answers. God never not answers. God never doesn't answer your prayer. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is not now. But God never hears your prayers and files them away to be forgotten. So the question is, whenever we pray these prayers, whenever we're faithfully petitioning God, whenever we're faithfully praising God, and whenever we're faithfully confessing our sin to God and confessing and professing who He is, how do we trust whenever the answer isn't what we think it should be. That's what we want to pack your parachutes with. We want to instill a faith in you that is not dependent on your circumstances, it's not dependent on the, the, the pacifier that you get, the pacifier that you're praying for, and, and you think that that's, that's the point of life. And, and if you just had this one thing, God, just give me this one thing. God, give me this promotion. Give me this money. Give me this car. Give me this whatever it is, and I'll be happy. Whenever we don't get that, how do we trust? And there are greater truths that we anchor our life to that I think Jesus addresses in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And so I, I think this is a logical next step in the conversation of prayer. How do we have a heart that trusts our Heavenly Father whenever the answer of our, heavenly, uh, of our heavenly Father to our requests is no or wait? I think Jesus points us to some key truths in John 14. Let's read. John 14, verse 1, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of the Lord, and as such, let's pause for a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for your divinely inspired word. We thank you for the freedom to open your word and read it boldly, publicly. Father, I pray that as we work through this passage, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would teach us. Father, I pray that the truth that we need to hear this morning would just jump off the page. And Father, that you would stir in our hearts as we consider the words of your son. Lord, we just thank you for this time together. Father, convict us. Father, stir us up to good works. And Father, change us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three things that I want to kind of walk through briefly that Jesus touches on in this conversation with his disciples. The context of this conversation, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's uh, begun the week leading up to the cross. And uh, what, what he's just done is he's observed the Lord's Supper with his disciples. And he's just washed their feet, this act of service that uh, typically uh, a king would not do. You wouldn't find a king stooping down to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, the last verse of chapter 13, Jesus uh, tells Peter, he says, Peter, you're, you're going to deny me three times. You, you say that you'll lay your life down for me. Here's, here's what's really going to happen. You're going to deny me three times. And then he transitions into this next chapter, transitions this conversation and says, don't let your heart be troubled. So what, is, what then is the cure for a troubled heart? It was trust in who God is and who Jesus is and, and what he's done for us. And Jesus points 
to the reality that gives us hope in verse 2 and 3 that first our hope in life is heaven and eternity with him. We talk a lot about heaven. We think a lot about heaven. There's a lot of good things about heaven. But I want to, want to be clear what Jesus seems to be saying that the treasure of heaven is here. It says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to myself. Here's the key. So that where I am, there you may be also. At the root of a troubled heart, at the root of a heart that's struggling with trust is the reality of separation from God. Our sin causes this. Isaiah says in chapter 59 that our iniquities separate us from God. In Genesis chapter 3, you see how Adam and Eve went from walking with God in the garden to hiding from him. This separation, sin causes separation. And we see here essentially that the heart of the gospel, the heart of Christ is that he's working to reconcile us and restore that relationship. So then this changes the way we look at heaven and the way that we think about heaven. There are things that are clearly good about heaven. The idea of peace and rest, the idea of contentment, the idea of that there's folks that are in heaven that we're, we can't wait to see. The reunion is going to be beautiful. Paul says that, that we're going to be know as we are known. So there's a reunion that's going to happen in heaven. So heaven gets sweeter the closer we get to it. Heaven gets sweeter as we consider more and more family members that one of these days we're going to get to stand around the throne with and worship. But that is not the true treasure of heaven. That is not what we delight in and those things are good and it's, it's right to it's right to delight in those but whenever we think of the sweetness of heaven whenever we think of the treasure of heaven we think about the history of mankind where we contend with separation from God separation from our heavenly father and that in Christ what we look forward to is being restored fully with him and so he tells the disciples I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be with me. Part of that preparation would happen later that week with Jesus shedding his blood for our sins, paying the price, essentially doing away with the Old Testament system of sacrifices because they're no longer needed because the perfect sacrifice is here, the perfect sacrifice that restores mankind to his creator. So therefore, Heaven, then, is restoration with the Father. That's what we look forward to. And because of this, Paul would say that as we compare our life with what's coming, that by comparison, there is no comparison. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. And then what Paul is not doing here is he's not diminishing our struggles. What he's saying is not, you know, the things that, that keep you up at night, that's no big deal. The reality is we have affliction in our life. We have struggles. We have trouble. There are things that are weighty to carry. But what Paul is saying that, that the perspective that we have whenever we compare those things with heaven Whenever we compare these things that are temporary to those things that are eternal, what begins to happen is these big things in life, these big burdens that we carry, begin to seem smaller and smaller. And the timeline of eternity, the years that we have here, which James says that our life is like a vapor. If you ever go outside, if we ever have another cold day here in Mississippi, it seems like we'll never have one. But on days that are cold, you... Like breathe and you see the vapor of your breath and it's there one second and it's gone just like that. James would say, that's your life. So that's why we don't put the same stock in our life as we do in our eternity. The good things in our life, we don't live for them like they are our eternity, that they're, like they're eternal. 
Likewise, the struggles in our life, we can look at those struggles knowing that they have a shelf life. The anxiety that you carry, the regret that you carry, the grief that you carry, there's, a, there's an end date to that. There's an expiration date to that. And that expiration date is eternity. And so what Paul is saying here is that whenever you compare your struggles, he calls them these momentary light afflictions. I'm not saying that we just are ignorant about them. I'm not saying that we look at them through rose-colored glasses because if anybody knew struggle, it was, it was Paul. Paul's story was basically, his ministry resume was like, I'm going to go to this city. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to get the, the daylights beaten out of me. And I'm going to leave, get thrown out, and go to the next city. I'm going to do the same thing. I've been shipwrecked. I've been snake bit. I've been stoned to death. And this is ministry for me. Paul says, I, I have a thorn in the flesh that I prayed that God would take away, but what God is doing is through my weakness, he's proving his strength. And so if anybody knows struggle, if anybody knows pain, it was, it's the Apostle Paul. Think about the perspective that he has. He not only knows about receiving pain and struggle, but he knows about dealing it out. His life was lived for a while, trying to squelch the movement of Christianity. And so Paul would understand affliction, both from being the recipient and being the creator of it. And he says that compared to heaven, compared to being reunited with your heavenly father, like the worst thing that I can think about here, if you do the math, the worst thing that I can think about here is light and momentary compared to eternity with my savior. Compared to an eternity of rest and good work in the new heavens and the new earth. And so Paul would go on to say in 2 Corinthians 4.18, so don't focus on what is seen, but focus on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Again, he's not asking us to live in idiotic denial about the heaviness of life. But he's saying that it's probably not a bad idea to look at these things through the lens of what is eternal and what isn't. One of these days, the anxiety that we've carried our entire life is going to pass. One of these days, we're going to experience a reality where grief is no more, mourning is no more. There's no funeral homes in heaven. There's no emergency rooms in heaven. There's none of that in heaven. And so one of these days, the, this temp the temporariness of life is going to be realized. And we're going to understand truly what heaven offers. And so Jesus would say that our hope in life is in heaven. He's compelling the disciples to think about the place that he's going to prepare for them. He's about to walk them through an entire conversation of where he's preparing them for life without him. Jesus knows what's about to happen. And he knows that the disciples need this truth to to be packed into their parachutes so that the next week, whenever he's crucified, they have something true and something solid to lean on. And so he would say that our hope in life is heaven and eternity with God. Secondly, our Savior is faithful. He says in verse 1, he says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, that statement's interesting because who he's talking to is a group of men who, even though they were fishermen and tax collectors, physicians, they lived in a culture that fixated on the history of God as their covenant-keeping God. They would have been well acquainted, even though they weren't in the temple business, they would have been well acquainted with God's faithfulness. They would have known the, the covenants that he entered into with Abraham with Jacob, with Isaac, with Moses, with David. They would have known that. And so Jesus is saying, you, you believe in God. You understand God's faithfulness. But then he says, believe also in me. He echoes the same thing in verse 11. So they would have known of God's covenant faithfulness, but what Jesus is trying to get them to understand is that 
He is the trustworthy word of God. John says in John 1, 14, John, uh, chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking of Jesus. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just as God is trustworthy and faithful to his word, Jesus is what it looks like for God to be faithful to his word. Jesus is the final word. John says he's full of grace and truth. The truth is that there was a payment that was needed for to satisfy the wrath of God. That apart from Christ, we are children of wrath. We are subject to God's wrath. And so the truth is that we deserve hell. We deserve separation because of the sin that we inherit. But the grace here is that he sent his son to bear the full weight of God's wrath to satisfy the wrath so that we don't have to live and step into eternity as children of wrath, but as sons of God. And so Jesus is a trustworthy, is the trustworthy word of God. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says this. He says, let us uh, hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. That section of Hebrews is this beautiful picture of how the Old Testament uh, sacrificial system is is obsolete because there's actually forgiveness. Verse 17 says, where there's forgiveness, there's no need for more payment. Where there's forgiveness, there's nothing else that you have to do except accept this forgiveness. And how through Jesus, we have that forgiveness. And so the writer of Hebrews would say that he who promised forgiveness and he who sacrificed in which we have forgiveness, he's faithful. And so the disciples needed to hear this as they were about to see their rabbi murdered on a cross. They needed to know that Jesus is trustworthy. Just as God is faithful to his word, we see that played out in Jesus' faithfulness to go to the cross. In Jesus' faithfulness to rise again, defeating death, hell, and the grave. Our Savior is faithful. And lastly, he's coming back for us. He's not forgotten us. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going to go prepare a place for you? Which, this is an important note in the character of God. God doesn't tell us things that he's going to go back and change. God, God's not going to tell us things that aren't true if we're, if we're looking for what is truth in this world. We don't look out in culture. We don't look at the whims of mankind or the wisdom of mankind, but we look at the one who says, if I've told you this, it's going to be true. And if it wasn't true, would I have said this? So we can have faith in God's word. We can have faith in what he said. He said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to myself. The reality of the life that the disciples were about to live is a reality that I think we need to contend with. We love to paint faith in this picture of everything is just okay. There's never anything that really shakes our faith, that we just have faith and it's never tested. But faith that's never tested isn't truly faith. Faith that's never tested never grows. And Jesus here says, if I'm, I'm about to leave you, if I leave, I'm going to come back for you. As someone who's dealt with separation anxiety, uh, a good chunk of my childhood, I needed to know the truth that if my parents dropped me off at school, that somebody was going to come back and get me. And I, I, I had to live that. I had to believe that. I had to wrap my mind around that. And, and I think that I've passed on separation anxiety to, to my daughter. Because every time that we drop her off somewhere, she asks that question, are you going to come back and get me? Who's going to pick me up? And we have this conversation that we've had for the past year and a half. And whenever she asks that, I tell her, Baby, 
Daddy's always going to come, come pick you up. Daddy's never going to leave you. And as this sweet little two-year-old girl walks through separation anxiety, she's not even realizing it. What I've, what I've seen is speaking things that are true gets ingrained into her heart. So that's why, parents, your words matter. What you preach to your kids matter. They watch, they listen. Let's not fumble the ball and give them junk that isn't true and that they can't root their life to. That's not the sermon, but I feel stirred up a little bit. Let's use our time to speak what's true because that's the only thing that matters. Because the reality is your kids pick it up. My two-year-old little girl, the conversation has gone from, Daddy, are, are, you gonna, are you gonna come back and get me? To now whenever we go somewhere and I drop her off, she says, it's okay. You're gonna come back and get me. You're gonna pick me up. I'm gonna be a brave girl. That's the truth of the love that I have for her being lived out. It's the confidence that, that this little two-year-old, sweet little girl understands that her daddy loves her and he's not gonna leave her. And so if, if we're living that out, how much more so is our Heavenly Father loving and perfect and merciful and faithful? And so we keep speaking this to ourselves that yes, he's gone away, but he's coming back for us. He's not forgotten us. He's not neglected you. He's not uh, just clueless to the, the, the struggles of your life. But he sees you and he has a plan. And that plan is rooted in his desire to, man, I want to be reunited. Sin has separated us. But let me show you how much I love you. I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to shed my blood to reconcile you, your sinful prodigal life to myself. And I'm going to come back for you. Our Savior is faithful. And finally, John 14, 6, it proclaims boldly that he is ultimately what we are seeking. In this life that would compel you to run after things that don't matter, run after extracurriculars that don't matter, run after money that doesn't matter, run after wealth, fame, idols that don't matter. At the end of the day, he is what we are ultimately seeking. Thomas asks the question, Lord, how can we know the way? And I wonder what Jesus, I wonder what his facial expression was. Because he'd done life with these men for the last three years. And I wonder, did, did he think, how, how do they not get this? Do they not see? Or was he just completely gracious whenever he said, you want to know the way? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. At the end of the day, he is the way to the Father. He is the truth about ourselves and about the Father's love for us. We understand the truth of God's wrath and the truth of God's grace. As we see Jesus on the cross, and he's the source of the life that we ultimately desire. Jeremiah talks about building wells that are broken. We build cisterns that can't hold water. And life is that. Life is the temptation to build wells that can't ultimately hold water, to invest in things that they, they don't fulfill what's in your soul. Because what the need that your soul has, the need that your heart has is for Christ and to be reunited and reconciled with your heavenly Father. And Jesus says, I am that. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. And so he is ultimately all we need. And the disciples needed to hear that. They needed that truth that, was, that, that is a cure for a troubled heart. Because Jesus knew that in, in this room, they might not experience the trouble. But at the end of his lesson, at the end of his conversation in John chapter 16, he says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. 
But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So trust in Christ is the cure for the troubled heart. Trust in the Heavenly Father who is faithful to his people, is faithful to his children, is faithful to his word, even when his word is no, is a cure for the troubled heart. So what we do is we don't let our heart be troubled because there's a place for you in your father's house. God's not waiting for you to reform your life. God's not waiting for you to feel guilty enough about your past sin that then there's a place for you. No, no, no. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Bring your mess to me, and I'm going to give you rest. Bring your mess to me, and I'm going to justify you. I'm going to give you the righteousness of God whenever you give me the mess of your life. Whenever your faith is in me, he says, there's a place for you in my Father's house. The fact that he prepares a place shows that he has a heart for his people. I love, I love the end of the book of Jonah. Jonah is a very dramatic prophet. He's got drama all over the place. He gets all bent out of shape about a shade tree that, G, that God gives him and then kills, him, kills the shade tree the next day. Jonah, Jonah's upset. In fact, if, if it were a play, if, we were using today's terminology, he would say, I'm just so mad I could die. And God says this to Jonah, you do well to be angry for this tree that you did nothing to create. Jonah says, yes, I do well. I, I, I want to die. And God's very clear that what he's implying is you didn't do anything to create it. So why do you feel so mad about it? If you're angry about this, why should I not spare the Ninevites who I created? God has a heart for people. God has a heart for you. So whenever we gather together, whenever we talk about making much of Jesus, what we hope that it is is not just a feel-good session once a week. What we hope that it is, is an opportunity to remember that we could do nothing to save ourselves, but God being rich in mercy because he has a heart for people, saves us, gives us a way that we can approach the throne of grace through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, that his heart is for people. Thirdly, don't let your heart be troubled because Jesus will come again to get his bride there's a lot going on in this world that we would wring our hands about. There's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot going on that is concerning. I would remind you that Scripture says in Psalms 122.6 that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that we pray for peace to happen. But I would encourage you not to get caught up in the fact that, okay, well, Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. So I can just coast. There's some of that out there. Man, this world is ending, so what does it matter? Revelation chapter 7, there's a picture of worship. It says that people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every ethnos of the world, every people group, not geopolitical people, not geopolitical groups, but every ethnicity of the world will be represented around the throne of God. And according to the Joshua Project, project estimates are that there are 7,400 people groups that have never encountered the gospel. And so unless my theology is way off, if if the picture of heaven is that every ethnos is represented around the throne, then what that means is, yes, we pray for these things. We pray for wars and rumors of wars that, that are it's a sign of the end of times. But what our job is, is still Matthew chapter 28, to make disciples of all nations. And until that happens then we have work to do. Whether that be being sent on mission, 
whether that looked like uprooting our life and, and going and living in a place where God is calling us to live. I know that's extreme, but God calls people. God still calls people. Because the reality is Jesus is coming back one day. And what he's done is he's given us a job to make disciples of all, of every ethnicity. We pray for those missionaries. We support those missions. That uh, if, if, you, if you do some, some research in the Joshua Project, Project and ministries like this, there, there's never been a time in history where God has gathered so many resources for the purpose of translating Scripture into every language of every ethnicity. Man, you want to hasten the coming of the Lord? Man, let's be about that. Let's, let's consider what Revelation says, but let's be about the things that we know, black and white, we're supposed to be doing. That's making disciples. And so we don't let our heart be troubled. That was another side note. Stirred up, sorry. Because Jesus will come again to get his bride. We don't have to let our heart be troubled at anything that this world Offers And finally, because Jesus is our hope for today and for eternity, let not your heart be troubled. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you don't know the source of peace, I pray that today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can place your hope and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And if you're here and you've walked with Jesus for years, maybe you need to, this reminder Maybe you're in a season where your heart is troubled. Know that whenever Jesus tells his disciples, let not your heart be troubled because these things are true. The truth that he spoke to Peter, James, and John, all the disciples, that's the same truth that we can root our hope and our life in. Let that be a reminder today. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for... Your faithfulness, we thank you that you are at work. You work through your people. Father, you've given us a job to do. You've commissioned us to be missionaries, whether at the ends of the earth or the ends of our street. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use us. Father, I pray that the way that we do life together, I pray that the way that we invest in one another, Father, that we would pack one another's parachutes with things that are true so that on the days that go sideways, Father, we fall back on truth. Father, on the days that are excellent and joyful, Father, we would be motivated by truth. Father, I pray that now as we respond to your word that you would just stir in our hearts, stir us up to good works. Father, we love you. We praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand and let's respond.
Amen. I hope that that is a reminder that compels us to live life for the sake of the gospel. John Newton, at the end of his life, said, My memory's failing, but two things I know clearly. I'm a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. And so let's live in that truth today. Church, I hope you know how much you're loved how much of a joy it is to gather with you and make much of Jesus and just to do life and to see you make much of Jesus out there. So we're praying for that this week. Um, Just by way of reminder on your way out, uh, drop your ballot and the deacons will be uh, stationed at each one of the doors. Drop your uh, ballot uh, in the baskets. Uh, And we are a church that practices congregationalism. Uh, The church is run by Uh, the congregation and church members. So we do ask that if you vote, uh, that it's only church members that vote. If you're like, I'm not a church member. Um, Well, uh, glad that you mentioned that. We would love to take care of that for you. Uh, We would love uh, to talk with you about how uh, to be a part of this uh, body of Christ here at Wade Baptist Church. But we do ask um, that church business uh, be uh, confined to church members. Um, So church, thank you again for worshiping with us. Uh, You're loved, you're prayed for. Let me pray for you one more time and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we just, uh, again, thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for these people. Lord, the fact that you call us to do life together, the blessing of relationship, the blessing of community, Lord, I, I pray that we would understand how much of a gift that is. And Father, use us today to stir one another up to good works. Use us this week to stir one another up to good works. And Father, may our lives just be a sign that points to the hope of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.